Talk about red hot, ladies and gentlemen. Those Philadelphians are the last unbeaten team in the MLS after winning their third straight on Saturday. We're going to discuss it all here today, but we're going to welcome you guys to this edition of PHLY Uni Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, JP Zapata. Tyler Zuli is behind the glass here today. And join as always, the lovely Renee Washington. Renee, what a what? first off, a wild weekend in Philadelphia. Wow. We had a lot going on. But in the midst of all this, the union, we'll talk about the second thing, but the first thing, they get the win in Nashville. They get the win. They get the win. The union have three straight wins in a row. They've also been taking care of business on the road, yeah, which has been nice huge. to see this season. Um, we're in the middle of an eclipse going on as we speak. The solar eclipse yeah. is happening. Like, what else? What else oh, can we say? Oh, my God. How can we forget this, oh, Renee? Oh, we were we about, to, our, about to our, go blind here. Oh man, we are ready. I actually can't see anything with these on. I literally can't see a thing. I can't see you. How many fingers are you holding up? (laughs) Just, just to let you guys know, by uh, by the way, that that still shot right there of JP with his thumbs up, not being able to see anything. That's a that's a thumbnail for like ever. Oh good, I'm keeping that in perpetuity. Great. <laughs> we are we are right here for the solar eclipse. I which... hope you guys have your solar eclipse glasses because it is absolutely going to be um, a wild, cool experience. But it's much cooler if you don't blind yourself. Yes. Uh, but it's great to see in the chat. We've got Provo and John coming up with some with some details, man. What a so Provo and John. You said you asked this last week, but it was late on the pod. Not too familiar with the MLS. At what point in the season can you make an accurate assessment of the team you have? Great question. We'll talk about that today. I know Jose is giving his answer to your question. We'll give ours as well on the show. Uh, Yishmeister, you're saying you, you think yours is similar. Um, and then Chaos, Chris, what's up? Hey. Nice to have all you guys here. Jose, Yishmeister, Chaos, Provolone. Hope you got all your uh, solar glasses. Yeah, so this morning, <laughs> if anyone watched the Anthony Gargano show, we had an, ast- we had an astrophysicist on, and he said around 2.08 today, PM, of course, Eastern Time. Yeah. That's when it should start. So that's in five in the, minutes. Yeah, in the midst of us recording, it's probably gonna dim here a little bit. So we'll we'll give you the live Ooh, feed here. Basically, from we're giving you a PHL live play by play of the solar eclipse. That's what we do here. Yeah. We're not a soccer game. Well, we got solar <laughs> eclipse going on here, ladies and gentlemen. But it is an exciting time because as we're talking through, we do have one team left standing. We had talked last week. There were five teams going into the weekend that we're still undefeated. And we were wondering who was going to be the last team standing. Right. It's the Philadelphia Union. I don't know if anybody could have anticipated, especially at the start of the season, that the Philadelphia Union would be the last team. Listen, this is not a championship. You didn't win the MLS Cup. Mm-hmm. You didn't win the Supporter Shield. But it is a nice, you know, you had to celebrate the small victories. And I think every once in a while, even as we're having this moment of the solar eclipse in life, you have moments that you have to take a step back And watch the moon cover the sun for a bit. And I think that's what this weekend to me was like, wait a minute. As much as we may complain about the Philadelphia Union and we still want more from them because naturally we do. Right. This is a moment of like, wow, they are they've eclipsed a major feat and are the last unbeaten team. There Uh, it is. There we go. Well, they are the last (laughs) unbeaten team. And look, I mean, I want to call myself out because, you know, a couple of weeks ago I was really down on this team and I'm wondering where this team was going to go. But you give a lot of credit to just the heart of this Philadelphia and Jim Curtin alluded to in the press mm-hmm. conference being able to win some of these matches on the road obviously playing a couple of weeks ago we played in portland mm-hmm. the first one of the season we all know traveling to the west coast is never easy winning in providence park is also never easy and then this past saturday you go to jodas park who listen we've had some success there yeah but in general it's not easy playing down there they do a great job it's a great match atmosphere they bring out great crowds as well Nashville, we, although we talked about it with Wes last week, are allowing a little bit more in goals here where they typically are much more stronger defensively. You saw what happened in that second half, and we'll dive deeper into it. But the Union were able to find a way, dig deep, and heart is the theme here, ladies and gentlemen. Heart Facts. with this team, being able to find a way to get three points. Not just, you know, typically I would think like, okay, you know, it's it's what, they get the, the first goal like in a 60-some mm-hmm. minute, and it's like, okay, we got a point. 
Jodas Park's not easy. Let's come back home. But no, 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 no. They were like, we won all three here, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. And they went in and got all three points. And Renee, it's it, on, on this eclipse day, the uni may be eclipsing our, our positivity That's again here in Philadelphia as they are the last unbeaten team in, in the MLS. Billy, get happy, get hyped. Let's figure out all the ways we can use Eclipse in today's show. Oh, oh my God, it's going to be a fun game here today. <laughs> but I will say it is, like, I, I think we have to kind of relish in this moment for now because, again, those small victories. This is a team that, at times, we've even here on the show talked about the frustrations yeah. and the lack of changes and growth and progress. Okay, this is this is progress because you now are sitting pretty nicely. And more importantly, as you talk about, you're getting results you're getting points on the road which is tough to do in the mls it's such a competitive league it's so it's so tight between the top and bottom and it is still so early in the season to your question earlier provolo and john about like how can you really when can you really assess and, and get a sense of like where teams are but to have six mls games under your belt <laughs> thanks tyler to have six games under your belt be three three wins in three draws and you're scoring <laughs> goals you've got you know 12 goals that you've scored. You've given up seven, but you're, this is a team that is right there that a lot of people would be wishing they had the issues that the union had. They were, they'd be wishing they were off the start. They had so glad to see this, especially a comeback win. you handle the adversity. And as you mentioned, as the game was trickling on in the final minutes, it did feel like even the broadcast was kind of putting a button on things of like, kind of wrapping up the game and starting to look ahead to next week, which you're, you're supposed to do. <laughs> but the game was far from done. And Daniel Gazdag with that late goal, you know, in the final final moments of the game to lift them up, there's a lot of positives to take away from this game, individual performances, and then definitely, of course, as we've already harped on many, many times to start off the show, the fact that the Philadelphia Union are still the un, the last undefeated team and had a nice moment post-game to celebrate that. Yeah. You know, these are the types of rah-rah, chemistry-building moments that give you a chance to feel like your team, all the hard work, okay, we are we are in a good spot. Despite, yeah. you know, frustrations, whatever, you're in a good spot if you're right now sitting undefeated. Absolutely. I want to end every show like the Union do every win. Let's do pizza and beer <laughs> every single it. time. Let's do I'm it. I'm down, I'm down. <laughs> no, but oh, like, I, I mean, listen, with, with this game, obviously, like we just talked about, playing at Geodis Park is is never easy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny you mentioned the broadcaster. I, I, I can't blame the broadcaster because, like, it's Philly. It's Nashville. These two teams yeah. are just so used to just drawing out there. <laughs> uh, but let's let's get into this match. Obviously, a 2-1 victory here for the Philadelphia Union. Right before half, Sam Surge from Schaffelberg, who we'll talk about, who had a great game, gets that cross in. And Surge, right place at the right time, put the Union down 1-0 heading into half. And so we head into the second. The big moment was subbing Ali Bedoya and Olivier and Baizu. Yes. Changed the formation up a little bit. We won't get to in just a second here, but Carranza gets the Union on the board in the 62nd minute there. Caran well, first off, it was a great setup play. Quinn Sullivan gets it right to Carranza, right on the outside. Boot gets it on the left side, 1-1. Mm -hmm. And then, like we talked about, we all may have thought it was going to be a draw. Yep. But who else but Daniel Gazek, who we're going to give his roses here today, gets the goal to get the Union the dub in the 90th minute, and the Union walk away here with a 2-1 victory. Renee, I want to start off this match because, listen, I thought the lineups were very interesting here for Jim. Mm -hmm. Now, for Nashville, obviously, the big thing is no Walker Zimmerman. We talked about that in yep. the preview show. Yep. That's a big, big, loss big loss for Nashville. So they lined up with three in the back. Interesting enough, two, Nashville typically lines in a diamond. Mm -hmm. Jim decided to also <laughs> line up with three in the back there. I want to start off with that there because my point of view is that why not go with the formation that you know has worked well? I get it. Like, you, you wanted to line up with those that three in the back. I understand you wanted to change things up, especially since Nashville can use the whole width of the pitch and you want to line that up exactly. Mm -hmm. But if you're confident in your guys, roll with what you know. Right. And so that's where my critique is. I'm curious what you thought about with Jim lining up in that three in the back there to start it off. Yeah, listen, we saw the formation, three in the back, five in the back. We saw Jim kind of experimenting with some things. I think, to be honest, when you look at this match, as much as it was kind of odd to see it happen six games in, I think it was needed. Okay. I think it's okay to do that because you have, first of all, against Nashville, listen, they've got one win on the season. Um, granted, they do have four draws, so it's not like they're you know losing a lot, but they're mm -hmm. one, four, and two with 
a win, four draws, and now two losses after the union uh, gave them number two on the season. But this is, it is still only April. And to tie in what Provo and John was asking about the timeline of being able to get a sense of where teams are, you still don't know yet at this point of the season. You've got a lot of teams that are still playing other games. You know, you look at New England Revolution, different teams that are still playing in CONCACAF play, still have to juggle the chaos of multiple schedules. The Union, because they did have an early-ish exit out of the Sweet 16, didn't have to worry about that. So I feel like the Union still are in a period where we still don't know their true identity. As we mentioned last week after that win, it felt like we're starting to see them come into form. And I think this week we definitely saw that continue. So each game has progressed, but we still don't know what's the best lineup. What's the best formation? What's the best starting 11? Who, you know, who's from that next group of like the Chris Donovan's, Jeremy Raffanello's can give you a little bit more. Marcus Anderson's can give you a little bit more, even in Baizo. So I think Jim Curtin, to be honest, is still experimenting a little bit. And you, it may seem odd because it's so early in the season, but this team has not been able to get a lot of clean sheets, whether in MLS play or in CONCACAF play. And there's definitely still room defensively for them to make some adjustments. I don't think they've been as clean defensively and organized as they would like. So we've seen the first part of that was the two center backs have been changing. We've seen yeah. a lot of different pairings between Damian Lowe, Jacob Glesnes, and Jack Elliott. But now it's, okay, maybe it's not a two center back. Maybe it is a three back. So I was actually okay with that because this is the time to try it out. I'd rather, let's see what it looks like in a couple of games and then go from there versus you never try it. And now as the season progresses, you're wondering. Like, I also want to see Damian Lowe in the midfield. Mm -hmm. I also want to see him there a few games and see what he looks like in the six. What does he look like playing with Jose as two holding middies? Like, there's a lot of flexibility within this grouping that it would be a disservice not to try it out. And so I'm okay with it because this is a game you should have won that game. You know, it's Jonas Park is tough to play in. Nashville is always, and as a growing rival, it's always a physical game. But this is the time to see what you've got. See what different matchups, combinations. I know even as talking to previous coaches and in my own coaching experience and playing experience, you want to see how different combinations work. How does Nate work with Quinn? Okay, we know what that looks like. But what does Mbizo look like, you know, working alongside Quinn or Kai with Julian. Like, you want to try different matchups and pairings on different sides of the field in different spots. So I'm all for it. And I know in the chat, I saw uh, Yishmeister mentioning how you and a friend were agreeing. Being knocked out of, of the CC has helped this roster because they don't have the money like LASC to have the depth. But, you know, now with less games, they can balance the MLS schedule much better. I do think now is the time, too. You're playing one game a week. You get a whole week of practice. Obviously, they do have that sprinkled in makeup game versus Seattle, but you get a whole week of practice for the most part each week mm -hmm. to really be able to use the weekend as like a test and then go back to the drawing board and make some tweaks and see what you want to what you want to change for the next week. So I liked it. Yeah, I guess you didn't. No, I, so like <laughs> I, I just from because I mean we saw it too in the second half when they went to that four four two diamond it really opened up the attack and I just think more so when they're in the lineup in that diamond like there's a couple players so like El Brujo. Quinn mm -hmm, Sullivan mm -hmm. and and Daniel Gazik at the tip of that diamond. I feel like when they play with more freedom, mm -hmm. when they're able to just play their game, that's when they're at the best. Yeah, Quinn, he, we've seen him how he's able to move all the way up in the attack. He right. helps out with that front line, and he also drops back. El Bruno Martinez. I mean, everything in front of that back line. That's his. That's his domain, and mm -hmm. he loves to help create the link the attack up from that spot too. So that's kind of where, where I'm at. But I just. I thought this game in general, it brought so many great matchups. The midfield battle yeah. between both teams was a lot of fun. Uh, even, you know, shouts to Nathan Harriel. Listen, mm -hmm. Vegas Schaffelberg, I told you when we were rewatching this before we were going live here, I don't see how Nashville keeps Schaffelberg any longer. Yeah. Like, the dude's got some great pace on that with. He's physical. Like, to me, mm -hmm. he's screaming championship. Like, a championship side should pick him up as soon as possible. But... You know, even like mixing in Godoy and Schaffelberg mm -hmm. had a couple opportunities on that left-hand side. And that's not an easy matchup. And a guy like Nathan Harriel held his own in that situation there. It was, it was really dope to see, but... Yeah, and I know in the chat, Ray, Provolone, uh, Jose, Chaos, Chris, the Ishmael, like, let us know your thoughts also. Um, everybody that's tuned in, hit that thumbs up button. But also, more importantly, let us know your thoughts on... Should are, Do you agree with Jim rolling out a different lineup? Or do you think that it's you know, too early to mess with things. So there's, so here's the other side of it. There's a couple factors. One is if you change things up too much too soon, it can throw people out of a rhythm. Yeah. Like athletes, we are 
all about rhythm and routine. And so to mix things up and throw a monkey wrench into things for some can kind of knock them off their game. But for others, it almost can like, I remember when we used to switch and play different formations, it actually would make me appreciate okay. our main formation that much more because I'm like, Oh good. We're back in the four for two diamond midfield. We're back in the four, three, three. I've missed this because every lineup does give you a different look like where you are, on the field, the runs that you're making, the movements, who you're matching up with defensively, it does drastically change. And so it allows you to have kind of a different flow to the game. And so I do feel like on the other side of that pendulum is to keep things fresh, to keep things, you know, you don't want it to feel stale of the same routine, formation, tactics, day in and day out. So I see both sides, but I think there's a balance of keeping it fresh without completely throwing the team out of any sort of early season routine. And yeah. like... Just go with the four three three. Let's let's line up in the four three three. I mean, you want to give people freedom, want to give something different. You know me. Uh, uh, it's my <laughs> dream that one day this team will line up and play in a four three three. Obviously, I one know. can dream, but that's I love the four three three. It's it, it's just a lot of fun. And like the thing is, like the things that we like to do the most, especially like uh, you can do in a four three three. But you know what else looked really good? And I hate to say this because I know the reason he wasn't starting wasn't it was injury or whatever was Mikel Ua. Yeah. And he not listen, the offense was moving very <laughs> a lot more. Uh I'm not saying it's because he wasn't out there, but I'm just saying he wasn't out there and the team offensively, the movement, the runs, the opportunities they were creating, the spacing looked really nice. So I don't know. I mean, I'm just I'm just throwing it out there that it just is it's just a fact. It's just a fact. He wasn't on the pitch. The team looked really good offensively. They've been looking good offensively. I think Quinn Sullivan, Julian Carranza, especially, like, they're playing with such an edge. The movement, the ideas. Nate Harrell's getting forward. Obviously, Kai's always getting forward. I feel like the midfield's been looking really steady. Great to see Jack McGlynn get his first assist of the season. Six games in. <laughs> center midi. Welcome. Finally gets his, finally gets his stat. Um, but I, I feel like the, it's starting to click. For the offense. Absolutely. I'll, I'll get to on a second, but I want to talk real quick about something else that looks good. And that's, of course, well, you guys can't see here, but we got our Olipop fridge here, ladies and gentlemen. Looks there freaking awesome. But I want to tell you guys a little bit about Olipop because, guys, listen, you know, I, I, when I used to work in restaurants, sodas were like my downfall. Like in a long shift, I would get a little Diet Coke in there, and that's my only time I would have some sodas. And sometimes I, I do miss a taste. That's why Olipop hooks it up here, ladies and gentlemen, because it tastes just like a soda, but it's not that bad for you. It's the world's first functional soda with a classic soda taste and has, and has benefits of plant-based fiber, prebiotics, and other botanical ingredients to support gut health. And that's important, ladies and gentlemen. Olipop is a new kind of soda that only has 2 to 5 grams of sugar and 9 grams of fiber per can. And it's available right now in, in almost 30,000 retailers worldwide, including their recent launch, at Wawa, ladies and gentlemen, you can get this John at Wawa now. Olipop debut in Wawa couldn't be more of a match made in heaven. A delicious, healthy drink meets a convenience store, both adored by a cult here. And of course, my favorite right now is the cream soda. Highly recommend that bad boy. I'm not even really a cream soda guy, but this one is really tasty. Of course, the traditional Coca-Cola you can't go wrong with as well. It tastes just like Coca-Cola. And right now, we got choked up with the promo code as always. Use PHLY20 to get 20% off your next Olipop order. Discount only applies to one-time orders, not to subscription orders. Olipop is sold online. Drinkolipop.com and available in almost 30,000 retailers nationwide, like we mentioned, including Wawa. It's also available in Target, Sprouts. I also did see it at Wegmans. It's local. It's available at Wegmans as well. ShopRite and Go Puff. So, guys, check it out. Thank you to our friends at Olipop. Oh, also, I want to just say thank you to our friend Jose because you <laughs> he clipped the, the the shot of us with our solar eclipse glasses on as a gif on Twitter, and it's it looks hilarious. Thank you, Jose, for that. Thank That's you awesome. for that. Uh, also, thank you to our friends down at Bet Parks for allowing us to be able to have some fun as we have a chance to have our Phillies opening day shows there. Uh, listen, we're brought to you by the Bet Parks app. You can get in the zone with Bet Parks Sportsbook app and have an opportunity to uh, make sure that you're having fun, winning some money, because there are some great sporting events coming up. There's always games. We just had March Madness Women's Basketball, the championship yesterday. Tonight, we've got Purdue and UConn men's basketball tipping off to see who's going to win it. So with the bet parks, you can be sure to find the some odds, favorite lines, underdogs, 
place those bets, win big, get in on the on all the action, and you can win your first ten dollar bet and earn one hundred and twenty five dollars in sports bonus bets. We love being able to bet responsibly and now getting a little bit extra. So again, when you win your first ten dollar bet, you get one hundred and twenty five dollars in sports bonus bets over at Bet Parks. Play for fun. You love to win. I know I love to win. Mm-hmm. Super competitive and making sure that you're betting and having fun. And know that, you, of course, if you download the app and play along with us, got to be 21 or older, please gamble responsibly. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants to help, wants some help, call 1-800-GAMBLER. But check out Bet Parks. Thanks to our friends at Bet Parks who always provide you with great opportunities to place those bets, get in on the fun, win some money, and all the great games and events we've got around sports to be a part of the action and cash in in a big way. Absolutely. All right, so to a point with Uwa. So, <laughs> like, Uwa, to me, my beef, he does everything right off the ball. Like, I, I think he he has great pace. I think he's, he, he's, he sets up the plays when he doesn't have the ball at his feet. My mm-hmm. beef with Uwa is when we're in that final third and you need to finish, he just mm-hmm. hasn't. And I know, like, listen, it was a tough start to the season. He was going through this visa issue, so he missed a lot of uh, preseason. Yeah. But that's my main beef. When you're the highest paid player, you're the DP of this team, we're going to hold you to that standard, and we're going to expect goals. And that's really where it's at. But, I mean, it was a coincidence that that attack looked pretty pretty smooth, especially in that second half. And, yeah, I mean, Uwa wasn't out there, Renee. Yeah, I think, to me, it comes down to wanting to score. And I feel like, I know in the chat, um, I believe it was, yeah, Yishmeister was mentioning that Quinn... Sullivan and Julian Carranza really are the guys that the team can really be built around. And I just think Uwa is not that, you know, because he's he is more, as you mentioned, he's more of the possession guy. He's going to give you some runs. He's going to compete. He's going to, you know. Uh, Something you probably expect contest. from Chris Donovan, not yeah, Uwa. Yes, which is ironic because they remind me of the same person. I know. And I think I've said that before. Like, I look at Chris Donovan and I see Uwa. But they're supposed to be completely different on – the depth chart, they're definitely different on where they were brought in and signed for. But they play so similar to me. Like, I think they both give you, they've got size. They, they're in the mix. They make good runs. But they're not going to be the one that's going to help you consistently win the game. Yeah. And I think Daniel Gazdag is finally feeling better, feeling the confidence around the goal because he's now had, you know, obviously a couple run of play goals, which has been something that's been a hurdle, a mental hurdle for him. And to be able to score... Whether it's, you know, a beautiful header like we saw this weekend or whatever it may be, that seeing the ball go in helps. As yeah. a scorer, you need that. And I, I think that's a huge boost right now because he had been struggling and he's been looking much better. But Julian, Quinn, and now with Danny playing much better, you build around them because they are guys that, in my opinion, have that next level urge and intensity. Mm-hmm. And that's what I feel like Uwa's missing. He gets yeah. around the goal and he gets cute. Yeah. It's like he plays a little bit hesitant at times he doesn't seem as hungry to score and that usually is the difference between scoring goals and the good tries like beautiful goal good try is you actually being around the goal and making that extra movement i mean danny's goal for example you just pull off the defender you judge the ball you set yourself up you're ready to finish you know goals happen because you are setting it starts before the ball is even at you like Mm -hmm. to score a goal is you already have had your body set up ready to finish. You know, the way you're attacking it, the way you're, you know, the way even men- mentally, Uwa doesn't bring us that consistently enough. We've seen him be that, obviously. He's helped his team out. You look early in the season. But I, I would love him to be that, and he should be that every day. He should every be giving, it should be, to be honest, Uwa, Kranza, and Gazdag. Yeah, yeah. No, I want to That should be your top, that should be your, your big three. Yeah. And I should be contributing, especially at a higher rate, especially with with Ua. But I want to talk, I want to shift over to Gazak because, wow, what a what a yes. what a turn on events here with Gazak here. And I I did think of you while watching the match because <laughs> Ga- Gazak was all over the attack. Like him and Quinn kind of were like mm-hmm. interchanging. But like like I t- like I told you like when, especially Gazak when he's playing with that freedom. I mean he's super dangerous and. Um, looking at his stats here from the game, obviously he had the goal, but an XG of uh, 0.45, three shots, all of them were on target and 75% on passing. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, he was he was absolutely on here. And, you know, we talked about um, Hungarian manager Marco yep. Rossi with his comments about Gazak and pretty much saying, like, Gazak needs to show more. And we all kind of felt the same way with his play here in the MLS. 
And these past two matches, I mean, he's got goals in back-to-back -back matches, mm -hmm. and I, I, something has arisen in him. I, I think that he's heard all this outside noise, and he's like, you know what? Michael Jordan, it. I took that personally. <laughs> yeah. And, and he's out there. He's playing much more in, much, much more enthused, and he's playing with, with like a point to prove, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And obviously on that goal, you know, Sean Davis, I mean, poor man. <laughs> he just he just misreads that ball. He just jumps right before, too, a little too early. And guys like at the right place at the right time. But, Renee, I couldn't think of anyone more deserving of yeah. that game winner than our 10, Daniel Gass. I know. But you know what? The thing is, he set himself up for that yeah. long before no, that play. Yep. So in soccer, a lot of times people will say, like, oh, that's an easy goal. Like, something like Daniel Gazzags, you can't miss that. You're wide open on the back post. It just essentially has to hit off you and go on the goal. But what, what even puts you in the position to score is exactly as you mentioned. Like, goal scoring comes from you putting in the work, making the runs, having the good chances. And it's usually the one chance that, like, is a gimme yeah. that you end up scoring because you've already done all the extra stuff. So seeing Dan Danny have that goal, now with that, he's got 55 goals ag across all competitions, one goal shy of passing and, and tying, I should say, Sebastian Latou's all-time record of 56. That in itself is phenomenal to see, well-deserved by Danny. He has, he's, he feels like, it feels like he's getting back to 2022, Danny, Ooh. to be exact. And that's got me excited. I hope it continues. But I think it's just him playing. He doesn't seem, it might have been the comments. It might have been the backlash. It might have been everybody saying he's just a PK scorer only that we're getting Danny at a spot now of he's just playing. You have to be that way. You have to just keep making runs, find the ball, get involved. Don't just stand and try to, when you try to play soccer cute and have cute little flicks and little cute passes, you're not helping anybody because that's not how the game is played. Like it needs to be ugly, gritty, getting into tackles, getting into defenders, taking people on 1v1. That's why I like Quinn. He makes mistakes sometimes. He's getting in line or trying to force a cross, or for, but he's trying. And those efforts, that missed cross that deflects off of somebody leads to that corner kick that Jack McGlynn knocks in for Danny guys back to score. Like it's the, it's the, effort that helps yeah. bigger picture and i think danny is finally getting back to i know jose also in the chat i'm gonna use the same the, <laughs> since jaylen's on the screen jose is mentioning uh jack mclin that's another one you know when you look at his stats i know jose you dropped in the fact that he had a really good sneaky game as well with 50 percent of duels one yeah also two area ones 36 out of 40 passes it's a good point because you need the Jack McGlynn's, the even you know, El Brujo, um, Ali Bedoya off the bench, those are the guys you need to have those quiet, consistent, good games yeah. where they're doing all the little things. This is the makeup of a championship caliber team. And I know I saw on Twitter people already claiming the, the Philadelphia Union now might be in line, I'm looking at you, Jeff, to win it all. But in all seriousness, these are the types of things that do make up a championship caliber team. When you have your top players – consistently playing well, but those middle of the pack guys able to Nate, Jack, Baizo, um, you know, obviously your back's getting steady. You have depth in the goal where if Andre's down, Oliver Zemla can step in and play well. These are the ways that you help build long term the depth and the pieces needed to be able to win it all. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get irrational and say that now they're gonna win the MLS Cup, but I do feel a lot more optimistic about this team JP after seeing they've had an every game different adversity. And they've still managed to squeeze out at least a point. Yeah. And now wins, yeah. more importantly. Book it. Book it with the futures. That bet parks out. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> Philadelphia Who Union. Who knows? Uh, no, but listen, it, we're only going to go as far as attack take us. It, it's just that simple. It is. Because this team is really solid at every single position, including mm -hmm. our attack. But uh, we all know that the attack can disappear at times. But this team is going to go as far as this attack is going to take us. And... Yeah, no, Jose is 100% right. Like, Jack has been, like, obviously, we've been talking a lot about Quinn because mm -hmm. Quinn, by far, has been the most consistent, and he's obviously had the stats right now. But Jack has also been really consistent as well. And it's not mm -hmm. even just the attacking part of it. Like, I see this yes. kid actually yes. making That's defensive plays now. And this is, listen, this is a kid who, that was one of his knocks. Like, mm -hmm. we don't know what he is defensively. Can he be physical enough for it? And I think that is what it was holding him back. I feel like now mm -hmm. that Jack has shown this new stop, this new form of his he that's going to be able to entice some of these teams all, all across seas but no i mean this attack in general has been really awesome to see um but with daniel gazak like even like seeing him when we're defending in our own zone 
and seeing him mm -hmm. lay his body out on the line. And we talk about it too, like with that counterattacking, something that's so dangerous with the unit the past couple of years is getting that counterattack going from that low block and mm -hmm. then using that speed to race across the other end. And so Gazak, let's hope that keeps going. Let's keep, hope that keeps moving. And he did not disappear. He did not disappear. You noticed him throughout the game, even before he scored. Like, I, the biggest thing is we're not asking him, and it's great. That's two back-to-back -back goals off of, off of uh, corners. You know, great. You're about to tie Sebastian the two for the all-time union record. Love that. But we're not even asking him to score. Same thing with Ua. We're not even asking him to score every game. We're asking him to just make an impact. Yeah. And he did that. Yeah. It's, it's that simple. And, like, look, when this team is playing as a cohesive unit, we know that's when they're at their best. This is not – listen – we're, you know, no disrespect to like the LAFCs of the world, the Miamis of the world, but you like this team, if they play as an, as an 11, they're going to win most of their games. We don't mm -hmm. have an Ibrahimovic. We don't have a Messi that's going to take over. Right. So this is going to be the way. And this is the main thing. We've seen a lot uh, of just good team play. Yeah, exactly. And I love that. I think it's needed to be able to finally get them over the hump, um, finally be able to see the hard work paying off seeing them being able to play consistent has been key too and i know jim talked about that they've, they've all kind of been harping on that like that consistency of now the identity is forming we mm -hmm. know what they can bring we know how they're competing um defensively they're figuring things out they're, they're just slowly figuring things out and i don't mind i said this earlier on the philly show i don't mind early season hiccups if you're learning through them and you're making progress and not continuing to make the same mistakes. Yeah. But this group does seem like they're progressing that, you know, probably by the summer, definitely j late May, early June, we'll have a better sense of consistently who this team really is and what they're all about. And one thing to always note here with the union, we always know, especially in Chester, when it gets warmer, right? When the jackets get put away, it, the sun starts coming out, you start feeling that 70, 80 degree weather the attack starts waking up. It, it, it's just always the case. This right. uni team always steps up in the summer. I, I don't know if it's just needing them to get a little warmed up. Or <laughs> they, just tip it, they just genuinely just love playing in the warm weather. But once it starts getting warm, this attack's going to get even hotter. And so that's what we're waiting for. You know, who knows? The way they're playing well, now, we might see that those six, seven goal performances again. I don't know. That's a good point, actually, JP, because I do think it's the time where their fitness really starts to kick in. And the gamesmanship really starts to play a factor. Mm -hmm. Like now is that time you're still trying to get into a rhythm, 90 minute rhythm, you know, the, the routine even now. OK, we're done. Uh, Conca calf play. Now we're playing once a week. What is that routine like? And I think by June, not only are you heating up with the weather, but I do think it's at a point where they're now kind of like flowing. They've got they've got the weekly schedule down they've got they're feeling good that pregame routine and you can also just go into games a little later without having to think about it you're just playing but i do want to say also um give a credit to the back line who has even with we've seen the flex of andre and oliver net and i know we'll talk about oliver as well more in detail but we're seeing the back line really also come into their own like this defensive unit has been the backbone of this team which has allowed their attack and even their middies to freely be playmakers. And I think now we're getting the union back where they're not seeming as tired, fatigued, making those mental, having those mental breakdowns and, and mishaps. Rusty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it seems like they're, they're kind of shaking off the rust and finally getting back to being that well oiled machine that usually is it. And it's not just the backs, yeah. it's exactly as you mentioned. It's Jack McGlynn sometimes being, the, at one point, he was the lowest guy on, on the pitch. Um, Daniel Gazdag's helping out defensively. Like everyone is staying engaged defensively, organized, and you see it all the way through where they're defending better as a unit. It starts, of course, with the forwards, and they're high pressing, they're chasing, they're buzzing around, and it's it's you know trickling all the way through the team. So that part's definitely a positive to see the progression. Yeah, I feel like with a lot of soccer fans, like playing good defense gets a little misconstrued. I think a lot of times it's mm -hmm. like, oh, do you do you risk your body? Like how skillful are you? Like, yes, those things are, yeah. they, they, they go in, you keep that in mind, but like it's truly like a team effort. The communication to has to be on point. And yes, you do have to be able, you have to be willing to, to, to risk your body. Essentially, you might have to take a ball to the chest that may hurt a little bit. You may <laughs> never know, but like those little things, the communication, understanding where you're at, positioning is so important mm -hmm. here as well. Um, Glasnus and Elliot, that was the main thing. Like, you know, they came off, the, they started off the season. They were obviously looking a little bit rusty. 
and yeah. they slowly have turned it around. Ellie had his best match last week. He still was mm -hmm. solid this past Saturday, but he was much better against Minnesota. And Glezes has gotten back to his uh, his rhythm. But oh, yeah. um, Low seeing Low with his speed, they they showed that little graphic um on Apple TV of the <laughs> fastest players on the pitch. And I was I don't know about you, I was honestly shocked to see that he was one of the fastest players on our team. I think Kai was the faster player. They say that Kai is the fastest player, which, by the way, we might have to do these 40-yard dashes. <laughs> Jim might have to, to I know, do these. Bring I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I believe that because, like, even, like, a guy like Carranza or Gazak or even our boy Marcus Anderson, we've seen some wheels on that kid. Yeah, I don't know true. if Kai Wagner is the fastest player on the pitch for us. Yeah, and the thing is, every okay, every position has a different type of speed. Like, Definitely the fastest like center midfielders back are more endurance where you're just able to just because you're just running the entire time. You're, you every once in a while you elevate to a sprint, but you're kind of just jogging around the entire time and then move into a sprint. Forwards and backs are more track type of speed where you're just right. explosive and behind. But Damian Lowe, I think I have seen him, I should say, on a few occasions as he's covering for like a Jacob Glesnes or someone. And he just out of nowhere just has he does also have a lot of speed. And I feel like because he's taller, maybe it gets misunderstood that it is him, like he is so fast. But he's he not only plays quick and has his speed, but he's also playing very smooth. Yeah. Like there's a lot more fluidity to Damian Lowe's game now, which is the evolution and maturity that we've seen, where it's not hesitant. He's just going, he's reading the game well, he's anticipating. And I really that's that's why I enjoyed the three back just because it gave all three of them a chance to be on the pitch together. Yeah. But I actually really do want to see him consistently in the midfield because yeah. I think his progression and maturity is allowing him to be someone that can be a defensive mid. He's got great size. No knock on Jose who battles. Don't get me wrong. El Brujo's out there giving it his all. <laughs> but to, like a holding midi, a six that can win 50 50s, get up on sometimes get into the box on both ends, obviously. But even getting up to the attack, helping to spray the ball, helping to switch the field, helping to stop in transition. I actually think Damian Lowe would be great in that spot just yeah. because of how he's been playing. Like out of the three of them, he's the most mobile. He's the most agile. He's definitely got the best pace. And I think he has, as a midi, you have to be comfortable with the game all around you. Whereas Jack and, and Jacob are best with it in front of them. Mm -hmm. So I hope that we get to see that next. Like I feel like Jim's been sprinkling out different small tweaks and changes here and there and i think i'd love to see that 442 or maybe it's a 433 actually mm, i don't know what that would look like actually maybe it is a 442 okay but you can't have damian and jose as the two center mid together because you have no attacking midi so it have to be a diamond <laughs> midfield mm, that's weird maybe jose's on the outside that's a possibility. Because he, he he could do that too. We talked about it earlier season. He has looked yeah. like that. Yeah, that definitely would be. Because you a can't do it as a box midfield. That's too flat. Yeah. You'd have to have some. You have to have some shape to it out other than a square. But I don't know. It's something to think about. Yeah, for sure. One thing we also need to mention here. So obviously, when you're facing Nashville and you're looking at Nashville's attack, obviously Schaffelberg on that left, like he's dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, two years ago, the MVP Honey Mukhtar is also still on this team. And listen, the attack oh, in honey. general for Nashville has been down. But it's always something you have to keep in mind that scouting report in Nashville. Mm -hmm. How do you contain Mukhtar? Uh, they did a good job. I thought they did a really good job of containing him. Yeah. Uh, he was a .03 with actually, which is not good at all, obviously. 85.7% with his passes. He only had one shot as well. Now, that in itself is good. Yeah. Again, Mukhtar is not having a great year. <laughs> not Neither is the Nashville attack. But it's always good to keep him contained because when you're talking about the dangerous attackers in the league, you obviously you're throwing Mukhtar in there as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And is listen, um, it is great to see the fact that they at least were able to hold him. Obviously, they gave the union gave up 11 shots total to Nashville. Um, both teams had five on target. The net uh, the possession did favor Nashville because typically the union do get out possessed. The passing accuracy and overall possession was in favor of Nashville. But Otherwise, you know, you see some good things, even the fact that, listen, they got the union generate more shots, but had less corner kicks. I still would like to see them give up less corner kicks because that is such a game changing aspect of of wins and losses in this league. But I do like the overall way they have been able to efficiently produce. Yeah, they're generating, they're producing, it's they're executing well. This is another game where in addition to the two goals they actually scored. You can pinpoint other op opportunities. Nate Harrell's corner that went just wide. 
you know, shot other opportunities that were really good chances that they just missed the mark on. So they're, they're create, you need to create those oh crap moments where like balls hitting the post or just sailing wide or the keeper has to make a really good save. So I like the fact that in addition to actually scoring goals, the union are still creating dangerous, not just getting in and around the goal, but creating dangerous opportunities. It's, yeah. it's, it's very nice to see. Let's talk some Zemo because yeah for, well first off well, well let's start off by saying this um i thought it was the right move of not starting andre you okay. especially when you're talking about the head and head injury yeah you want to be extremely cautious mm -hmm. with that um and we have the luxury now of having a young backup here who you slot in there and you don't have to worry about and renee every one of these starts i feel better and better and better about having mm -hmm. zemla out there and to the point where it's like almost obviously Andre Blake is a legend in this league, but I'm fine with having Zemla out there. He had mm -hmm. some big ones. I, I think about that Godoy, uh, that ball that kind of was like a rebound that kind of trickled yeah. some in the box, and Godoy had that curler. And if Zemla didn't get that mitt in front of it, I mean, it's probably, you know, one of the top goals of, of the week here in the MLS. But Zemla held his own, his composure mm -hmm. is huge. He's obviously big himself too, but, <laughs> you know, it feels good to see that we have. A good situation here the backup goalie wasn't really the same last year okay <laughs> <laughs> the depth the depth and goal has been huge it's clearly paid dividends early on and been a major um important piece because you can't rely on one goalie there's it's too long of a season i don't care how old or young a goalie is to be mm. honest like even if andre was five years younger and didn't have as much mileage on the tank you still cannot just heavily put all that on one keeper. It's too much soccer and they're going to get burnt out. And also goalie is such a high contact position that an injury is bound to happen at some point. So I agreed on the fact that don't rush him back, give him a full, like over a full week off of, I'm sure, you know, shut him down from activity. And now you can ease him back in versus having to feel rushed to have him jump back in. You didn't have to have him out there. And Oliver Zemla clearly has been showing us uh, that he is capable of, of the job. I think he reads the game well. In addition to his actual good size, I think he's got good hands and does a good job. Like, he's very springy, so I feel like he's, his saves yeah. are just, like, he's, he's got quick hands, I should say. Um, plus, he does a good job off his line in general, just kind of cleaning things up. Solid goalie, solid goalie, and has been, and has had some really good saves, too. Some yeah. really highlight, like you mentioned that one, but some really good highlight reel saves of like point blank opportunities that he seems composed in. Yeah. He's not frantic. He's as a goalie, you have to handle the chaos and you have to have a little side of craziness too, to be honest, that is true. to handle all this chaos. And I think he's doing a good job of it. Um, I know speaking of chaos, the Meister, you're asking out what happened in Brazil. Um, we're going to get to some other chaos. We'll get there soon. Real, real quick. <laughs> I, I know no one wants to hear this, Renee, but um, uh -oh. Ernst's signings have not been terrible. I mean, we, I, I mean, you, everyone hears us gushing over Marcus Sanderson every week, but no. Zemel has been a really solid backup here. Um, yeah, it's, it, these have been some, obviously we need to see some, we haven't even seen Verdicio yet uh, right, in right. the, in the regular season or even CCC, but no, I mean, Marcus Sanderson, I, I think that later on when we obviously have more rotation needed, you may see some more of him, but you saw a little glimpse of him. Mm -hmm. You saw he's able to bring, he stretch out those back lines. And Zemo has been really strong as a backup goalie. I mean, mm -hmm. look, I still, that's not saying that, listen, what Ernst is doing, obviously we keep doing like, because I still think more money needs to be splashed on this team. But I mean, it, it just again shows that Ernst's eye for talent is spectacular no matter where it is. But imagine if you had a little more dough. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It would have been, would it would be nice. It'd be <laughs> nice. Listen, beggars can't be choosers. And I do feel like, as much as we have questioned so much about the union, uh, the decision making, at the end of the day, so far, you know, that's crazy. Okay, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you your credit. I'm gonna give you your credit <laughs> because it definitely, right now, we've been seeing um, these small moves. These, it's just depth pieces, and you're giving guys a chance that have been making progress. They're young. They're hungry. They. You know, they, they bring in even that factor of the competition and competing for spots and being able to hold down a spot as a starter or good off the bench minutes as a reserve. So I am, yeah, I will say we even on this show have been critical yeah. and I'm glad we were wrong. I'm actually very happy we're wrong. I know many union fans have been very critical about, you know, ultimately 
what this team's been doing, why they're just running it back. But to be honest, they're not. There are some changes, and it, it's so similar to last year where you had the core still there, but it is a different makeup, especially with Quinn playing better, Nate playing better, Jack playing better, but plus adding in, uh, you know, Oliver Zemla giving you quality minutes, Marcus Anderson giving you great minutes, um, even getting – Jeremy, Jeremy Raffanello more minutes. Oh, Chris please. Donovan more minutes. Need to see more from him. Yeah, still need to see more from Jeremy. So I do feel like, okay, we're getting, all right, all right, Jim Ernst. Okay, I see y'all. See you. Absolutely. I, I see you like I'd see the solar eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the way, we're, we're not there yet. It still looks pretty, uh, pretty clear out there. So maybe after we're done, we'll see. But we still have about 15 minutes here. For the show, we've been wrong about maybe <laughs> criticizing the offseason here for Ertz, but what we are right about is that Coors Light is the lightest mm. refreshing beer out there. That's right. Our friends over at Coors Light, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you guys get yourself some of that Coors Light here because, listen, Philly sports, especially union, can be extremely stressful, especially you know when you're clamoring to spend more money for your soccer team. Well, why not just take it easy, chill out, and have yourself a nice little Coors Light? Because when the mountains are blue, you got to pick that Coors Light, ladies and gentlemen. I love Coors Light because, listen, I'm more of a, of a craft beer. I do like my IPAs, but I can't do too much of them. So I switch over to Coors Light because it's, it's a little more lighter. It's more refreshing. I can drink a little bit more of those. But, of course, guys, um, the best part about Coors Light is that not you don't have to go to the beer store or the liquor store anymore. They deliver it right to your front door right now. And all you got to do is head on over to CoorsLight.com slash P-H-L-Y soccer to get your Coors Light delivered to you. And when you choose to rise above, choose it all. Choose chill. Choose Coors Light. Get Coors Light delivered straight to your house. Again, CoorsLight.com slash P-H-L-Y soccer. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. Yes, and while we're talking about some great ways to be responsible, let's talk about how you can be financially the solar eclipse. Solar eclipse just hit us. Guys. <laughs> did we just get hit by the another moon? another earthquake? <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> Yo, what did it take? We had a solar eclipse, an earthquake. I mean, bees have been swarming outside like crazy. <laughs> um, we had flooding. Like, should we be concerned? Well, if you want to go somewhere, you don't have to worry about being concerned. That's over with Trumark Financial Credit Union because they don't want you to have to concern and worry about your finances <laughs> at all. When you join a credit union like Trumark Financial, you become a part owner which means profits come back to you instead of going to shareholders. And over at Trumark, they have better rates. They've got lower fees, a better return on savings, and more flexible options with all the same digital tools that you can have right at your fingertips. So the technology and the digital tools make it even easier, make your lives easier for how you're managing your finances. And Trumark also has local roots. They're headquartered right in Fort Washington, but they've got a ton of branches, 24 to be exact, in the Philly area. I just passed one the other day. I was like, oh, what's up, Trumark? I just passed one the other day in the Philly area off of Broad Street, and they do serve our community and our people right here at home in Philadelphia. So you can become a member of a credit union that has a lot of benefits that help you versus just being a customer at a bank. And over at Trumark, they want to make sure they really just help provide you with the best opportunities financially to be responsible, to plan for your future, to get your savings in check, and really to be able to build. So head over to crewmark.com slash P-H-L-Y to learn more and also to be able to find a branch near you. That's crewmark.com slash P-H-L-Y and Trumark federally insured by the N-C-U-A. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's, let's move forward here, guys. A big win here for the U on Saturday, but that didn't end it. Because our Philadelphia Union under 17 team mm, brought home. Some they were shaking things up like the earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> they brought home some hardware, something that the senior team is still looking to do here this year. But they brought home the Generation Adidas Cup uh, under 17 championship home after they uh, beat um, here. I lost my spot here. What they won, they won the chain. I'll grab the team in a second. They won yeah. the championship here. Um, it was really cool. Diego Rocio wins the tw uh, the tw man of the tournament here. But it was LA Galaxy against the LA Galaxy. Thank you, Renee. The they beat the LA beat LA Galaxy here in the shootout. Diego Rocio wins the player of the tournament. Um, that was really cool to see. Um, but unfortunately, it was overlooked here because of the situation that happened in the semis against Flamenco, uh, where we are still trying. There's a lot of back and forth going on. To be quite honest with you guys, but. What we do know is that there was some racial abuse being thrown out there. Uh, Flamenco, they withdrew from the tournament themselves. 
There would keep in mind that in the previous round there was a situation with the Red Bull, which mm -hmm. they pulled themselves out. Kudos to them too. Uh, so unfortunately, listen, it was an awesome situation here for the Union to win back to back here for the under 17s. Right. But unfortunately, we have to deal with the racial abuse in the situation that happened on Saturday. Uh, we did see the clip here, which I did. I saw from Jimmy King. I think someone else put mm -hmm. it out there of the video right outside. At, so near the buses, uh, the Flamenco players went approached the under 17 team of the Union and it was an attack. Essentially, it was just a disturbing scene to see. Stuff that we just don't want to see in our game, but obviously we cover the team. We have to bring this up. Um, but Renee, it was like a mix of emotions here. Obviously, yeah. we're extremely happy for our kids, but racism has no place in our game. And unfortunately, we did see it on Saturday or on Sunday. Yeah, and it's a shame because uh, for the Philadelphia Union, the U17 Academy squad, uh, to be able to have such success and, you know, you look at a player um, like Diego Rocio, who's, you know, scoring goals left and right, great, tremendous forward. Um, obviously, we've talked a lot about Kevin Sullivan, and there's a lot of talent on this academy, in the academy in general. There's a lot of talent there. The future looks really bright. And to have the opportunity to win the Generation Adidas Cup back-to-back, -back, winning it in penalty kicks the way they did, it's it should be exciting. It should be what the main focus is. And... Like, I know I looked at and the first thing I thought was, wow, you know, the future for the union is extremely bright. As much as we wonder about the homegrowns and we wonder about, you know, all that's being done to continue to feed the senior team. And I know, Jose, you're bringing up Andrew Rick. He's one of those players that you're able to feed into the senior team when needed. Andre Blake's not playing. OK, we're going to re-sign Andrew. We're going to sign Andrew Rick to, you know, be able to play with the senior team as a backup if needed. They have that fluidity. And that's great. But what's not great is another incident involving the Philadelphia Union around racial insults. Mm -hmm. And to read that and see that Flamengo, when I, I first saw the video and was like, whoa, what's why? Why would they be? Why would Flamengo be attacking the union after they lost? And my thought was frustrations boiling over. You're mad you got knocked out. But the way they attacked them, you can tell it was it was more than that. And so then I, I, my thought was, let me wait until I see and hear more about what's going on. And then to hear Flamenco pulled themselves, as you mentioned, out of the third place game because they dealt with, they had two red cards and their assistant coach was ejected or in the game against the union because they had racial insults said to them. One player from the Philadelphia Union Academy team has been suspended. We don't know the player's name because they are minors, so they actually don't release the names. Smart. Um, but it came across like it was multiple people for the union because it was saying victims, it was plural, incidents, racial insults, as if it happened on more than one occasion. And it obviously has happened on more than one occasion because, as we know, we saw it with CF Monterey and the Red Bulls as well. Yeah. We saw it with Mexico and U.S. men's national team. We've seen it on so many different spots, but this is yet again for us talking about the union specifically, we had the Kai Wagner situation back at the end of last season. We have now the U-17s out here also. Don't know how many people it is, but it's as at least one that's getting caught up in saying racial insults. And Tyler and I were talking about it in between sh uh, the Philly show and this show of like, listen, I'm a big trash talker. Many of us are trash talkers. Tyler claims he's a trash talker, allegedly. Um, we, <laughs> as trash talkers... <laughs> You don't go that far in all yeah, seriousness. No, yeah. Like you can talk junk. You can have this great championship game or semifinal game where it's back and forth and it's heated and it's physical. Mm -hmm. Coaches are getting into it. Players are into it. The fans are into it without chance from the fans, without players saying stuff to each other. There's got to be a fine line. And yet again, here we are in soccer. It always happens in the soccer world. And it's so frustrating to see. No, we're not seeing as many as much as we did in the past of bananas getting thrown on the field oh, and gosh. signs and different things. But we're still getting the same racial slurs and, and incidents that are unacceptable. And so I am I was kind of surprised by how fast they did the apparently they did the thorough um, look into the incident to right. just only have one player suspended because yeah. from what I the, what I gauge based off of Flamenco's comments is that it was. Like the the term the the things of what they're saying is multiple racial incidents, multiple victims of on their team that that dealt with it. It didn't like 
athletes from our squad victims of racial insults. That's not one person. That's not a one-on-one -on -one thing. That's coming across like more than one person heard something discriminatory. And it even said, you know, yeah, one, okay, the one player that was um, suspended is the first one that mm -hmm. was pointed out, but the red cards, the coach getting kicked off, that's not around just one person. So I don't know. The MLS is apparently doing, um, you know, they, they did a review and that's how they led to the one person being suspended. But I feel like there needs to be more looked into because there's no place for this. And as much as the league has been doing a lot, we just talked, I feel like a week or so, two weeks ago, maybe uh -huh. it was, about the policies that they're putting in place, the anti-discrimination policies and the way that the uh, players union and different, you know, uh, coalitions are looking to make sure they're not having these racial incidents happen. Mm -hmm. What is being done on the youth level? It's clearly starting there. Yeah. And that's the, no, that's the important part because that's the future, not only of, right. of our society, but of our game. And this stuff cannot happen whatsoever. You brought up good points. Like, you know, we we had this conversation at the end of last season with mm -hmm. Kai Wagner. Like, in the heat of the moment, yes. Like, obviously, a lot of things are said. But one thing that should not, you your mind should not go towards racial thoughts. Like, that's, like, mm -hmm. it shouldn't even come up into your head. Uh, it is extremely frustrating to see, uh, like we talked about, this is an awesome tournament. Like, this is the future of our game. And this is stuff that shouldn't happen. And like, unfortunately, like, we don't know exactly what happened because there's a lot of he said, she said. Exactly. Um, on both sides. And obviously, we saw the stuff with the Red Bull. Uh, so, I mean, we're not going to sit here and speculate what happened, but we just want better. I, I think it's very simple. Like, we should want better not only for our senior team, but for all of our youth teams as well, especially with the youth. Because, like we just said, they are the future of our society here, and mm -hmm. they shouldn't have to go through this. So it was extremely disappointing to see I, I, that that video of the attack. Uh, I mean, that was very off-putting for myself. It was, it was sad. It, it these was are so kids. sad. These are children that, uh, that, and and clearly, first of all, you're saying things that are inappropriate that you shouldn't be saying. Yeah. And these are kids that feel like, oh, I'm sad on both sides because first of all, for the kids that are hearing this, you shouldn't have to. Mm -hmm. You should be able to just play the game you love without having to hear these racial slurs. But on the other side, for whatever was said. To feel like I'm so I'm so frustrated and annoyed and bothered by you, and I'm trash talking you so much. I'm gonna hit below the belt and say something that's racist. Like that to me is even watching the video because I just watched it again. Actually, even watching the video and seeing how they come storming across, like they were hurt. That's that's any sort of racist, discriminatory remarks. And as someone that's been on the, you know, the, the, the bad side of them and has received them, it, ha it, it takes you out of your element so much because it makes you like, dang, what did I do to you? Like, how, I, I'm just here, I'm just here trying to play soccer. What did I do to you that it goes so far where you feel like you have to say comments to me or disrespect me or tear me down that way? So yeah. I, it's a sad, sad situation education clearly is needed but some real action is needed like let's not continue to slap this on the wrist of like putting out these fluffy statements like what actually is being done because in the last since the end of last season because it wasn't just Kai Wagner we had the Cincinnati incident there were a couple others sprinkled in since then we've seen the MLS those MLS end of season issues the U.S. men's national team in Mexico and now Red Bulls in Monterey Union U17 because that was the U17 also Union U-17s with Flamengo. There's multiple incidents that we just have talked about on our show, and there are more that have happened. And what actually is being done? You have these great opportunities for international competition, but you can't continue to have international competition if teams can't respect each other. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it is truly heartbreaking here, guys. And obviously, if some more reports come out, we'll definitely put it out there. There's, I'm reading right now, there's a really good thread here um, from the opposite side, a journalist from Brazil, Rajneel. I'll retweet it from the uh, PHLY Union account so you guys can read it as well. Yeah. Kind of go in depth from the other side. It, it, it Listen, it, it's just an unfortunate situation, and so uh, we'll have to see if more does come out. But on a positive note, listen, I, I do love that this the Union fan base is showing more love to not only Union 2, but some of the youth teams as yeah, well. Yeah, I do notice that. So, like, you know, past couple of years, like, now the, the love for, like, the youth teams was not there. Like, there was a couple of fans that were really into it. But, mm -hmm. like, seeing reports, seeing a whole supporters group, the Bridge Brigade, mm -hmm. which, by the way, this is an open invitation. We would love to have some of you guys on here to get your guys' thoughts on just the Union 2 in general. But 
um, it's it's definitely cool to see, and we'll definitely have some more coverage and content on it because I think it's a beautiful thing. And you never know, Renee. Like, I mean, who knows on this Union Two team that may be a big part of this Union team, mm -hmm. and we're not we don't even know who this player is. So I think it's really cool, and I think we we should definitely show the people a little more. Yeah, well, too. this is why it also makes it more disheartening that the Union U17 team is caught up in racial allegations because there are more people paying attention. You know, I saw a lot of people sharing and congratulating them, myself included. I know oh, yeah. we, we congratulate them from our show uh, Twitter. There are a lot more people that are paying attention. because, And it's not just about Kevin. It's about there's a lot of talent David in the Askers. Academy. There's a lot of talent in the pipeline that, you can, that a lot of people are looking forward to. And so... More and more are paying attention. Plus, with social media, you're getting more clips. You're getting more updates about what they're doing. But these aren't the updates we want. We want to see them doing good things because this makes me nervous. Wait, uh, okay, wait a minute. Does this mean that in the future, the, the homegrowns, instead of that blue collar, Quinn Sullivan, Aronson Brothers, Nate Harriel, like these guys that are just very likable and down to earth, is this what's in the homegrown system? It just, it's like, it's like there's pee in the water and it's like, it's, it's messing it up, tainting it for everybody. And that's a shame because there are a lot, a lot of these guys are talented and they are working hard and the bad apples, you don't want them messing up the whole bunch. So it's sad that we are even having to have this conversation. I really do hope something gets done to educate them. Yes. And I know a lot of people are actively following them, covering them. Um, Jose, as you're mentioning, Matt Ralph being one of them who does a good hey, job covering them. You know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of people that are actively covering the union, tweeting about them, writing about them, posting videos, sharing updates, because it's exciting to see what the future holds. But the future needs to be a little bit brighter and a lot less uh, racist and discriminatory. Like, let's, let's, get, let's get that straightened out a lot quicker and make sure that, um, you know, moving forward, we don't continue to have the union or, or soccer in general, because it's not even just about... Philadelphia Union, soccer in general, caught up in these awful, awful situations. That's absolutely terrible. If we can ask for anything, just no racism, is that? That's it. A lot. To ask That's for? it. Jeez. Just play soccer, talk, <laughs> talk junk. Get it. You can even get in each other's faces. You can celebrate. You can lightly taunt like whatever but you don't have to be racist you don't have to be discriminatory i don't not think that's all. too much to ask not at all i 100 percent agree with you right right you ready to catch some of the solar eclipse i do yes i'm gonna go see it I, I see people posting about it and sharing pictures and we're stuff gonna, i want to see what all the hype is about the moon the moon that's awesome we're, we're gonna try to sun. see we're gonna try to see how much of it we're <laughs> gonna catch here so Stay tuned, guys. We'll, we'll try to have another preview like we've had in the past two weeks here to get you guys ready for Atlanta. It's the Union Ooh, versus Atlanta. Lee. It should be a lot of fun here. Any last words here for everyone before we... Uh... Another chance for the Union to get three points. Um, also, great to see the fact that, excuse me, the Union get another opportunity just to showcase that this is not a fluke. I think that's even the bigger part. Like, being undefeated, we don't expect them to go through the season undefeated. Hey, South Carolina just did it. Congrats to hey, them. It's doable. Dawn, my it's doable. girl. Dawn and, and South Carolina did just run through and Hell win. Yeah. That was so, so awesome to see. That game was incredible. It's possible. It's very hard to do. And so the bar's not that high for me. I just want them to do well. But I also, most importantly, want them to show, continue to show us what they're truly made of. Hell yeah. Be consistent. Show this is not a fluke. This is not an oops. This is not just because Nashville's bottom of the standings. Atlanta's more middle of the pack. Let's see what you got, um, you know, going up against a really good Atlanta team. So I'm excited for it. I'm looking forward to seeing what this game. It's an early start. It's, yeah, you know, it's, it's nice to play at Mercedes Benz. It's not a far road trip because they have had a lot of time zone changes, country line, you know, playing in different countries, different things. So get your gas station wings, guys, in Atlanta. Yes. In Atlanta. Atlanta. <laughs> All right, that's gonna do it here. <laughs> that's gonna do it here for this edition of PHLY Union. We will catch you guys at the next one, but make sure you guys hit that like button, subscribe. All of our live shows are here on PHLY Sports, so make sure you guys are subscribed. And we want to thank you guys for pointing out the podcasting. We have that fixed. Oh yes. So make sure you thank guys you subscribe and rate. This episode will also be broadcasted through podcasting wherever you stream podcasts. For Tyler Zuli behind the glass, Renee Washington with me as always. Of course, I am JP Zapata. We'll see you guys at the next one. Dupe on, Philly. Bye. We all silly like the mayor.